As part of their enduring commitment to justice, equity, and expression, the Open Society Foundations are proud to sponsor Many Lumens. You're listening to Many Lumens, where we talk about and find meaning in the intersections of art, social change, and popular culture. I'm your host, Maori Carmel Holmes. For this episode, I'm speaking with Kame Ayewa, also known as More Mother. Hailing from Aberdeen, Maryland, she's a songwriter, composer, vocalist, and artist who spent years organizing and performing in Philadelphia's underground music and cultural community before moving to Los Angeles. She released her debut album, Fetish Bones, as More Mother in 2016, and has since put out a number of albums, solo and as part of the group Irreversible Entanglements, and most recently, her second album, Jazz Codes. Kame is an exceptionally eclectic figure, and in our conversation, we talk about her formative intellectual and musical influences that include gospel, Bob Marley, and Patti LaBelle, to name a few. We touch upon her journey as an artist, from her early days performing at the Black Lily, forming the Mighty Paradox, to her success as a solo project and her continued collaborations, including her involvement in Black quantum futurism with her partner, Rashida Phillips. Kame is truly an inspiration, constantly pushing boundaries. And now for my conversation with Kame Ayewa. You've been described as a poet, rapper, musician, noise artist, sound artist, dub poet, punk rocker, community organizer, composer, gym teacher, curator, producer, coach, activist, Afrofuturist, and more. <laughs> How would you describe yourself? Well, I'm a creative, and um, I specialize in uncovering the unknown. I'm really interested in history and futurism i love learning you know so i would say i have a appetite for learning things i like to approach like the creative my creativity to every aspect of my life you were born and raised in aberdeen maryland a small town north of baltimore and i was reading that your family has been there for at least three generations. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you what growing up there was like and how did it shape your understanding of the world? Growing up in Aberdeen, it was everything to me. The utopia, you know. I grew up in a place called Washington Park and it was like 99% all Black people and we created mm. our own economic systems where we could depend on each other, where folks could be creative not having to like go outside their apartment to own property people had stores i was actually just talking yesterday about this woman who would make the best candy apples (laughs) that i've ever had (laughs) and i can't go back to get them again you know that kind of thing is just really uh amazing it showed me to be a self-starter that i didn't really have to wait for anyone to have an idea and put it forth you know so what made you leave this utopia? You know, what sort of prompted you? Was it just college or did you have um, ideas about your future? Uh, it was just college. It had been senior year and everyone was going somewhere. I mm. was like, OK, <laughs> I need to go somewhere, too. You know, that kind of thing. And so I just decided to study art. And how did you know that that was something possible for you? You know, so many people in our culture are discouraged from studying art. So what made you pursue it? Well, I wanted to be a basketball player, professional basketball player. And uh, I had bad grades one year and I begged them. I said, oh my goodness, if you don't let me play, I don't know what my life is gonna be, you know? They still didn't let me play and they put me in art class. Hmm. I loved it. You know, we had to do a project about a musician and I chose Bob Marley. And I didn't know much about Bob Marley, but I loved him. I thought he was so cool. You know, I saw a guy with a guitar, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. And I always liked punk rock music when I was a kid. So I was like, wow, this is really cool. Someone with an electric guitar, but also singing folk songs, stuff that you could hear in a community. Mm-hmm. I thought that was really cool. 
so I just became obsessed with Bob Marley <laughs> and then poetry and things like this. Um, it's interesting because I was reading about your family's playing in the house of gospel music and your own singing in the choir. And I think about, of course, Bob's training in gospel as well and the emergence of, you know, reggae out of a gospel tradition. And just curious for you, uh, what did you learn from gospel that has stayed with you? The joy of singing. Hmm. My sister and I, after choir rehearsal, we would just sing in the house, you know, and it was so much fun because we had three-part harmony, you know, it was like soprano, alto, and bass. And it was so cool to have these like three-part harmonies where you can sing different parts. And we just sing all the time. And I think that was my favorite thing. But I quit the choir to study Taekwondo. I also love martial arts and this idea of, I guess it's kind of like the spiritual aspect of meditation and monks going to the up into the mountains and vows of silence i just was into that as a kid also inspired by like malcolm x's trip to mecca Mm -hmm. i thought that was so cool so i was just into that kind of thing that's that's amazing (laughs) i feel like i want i wish i had known you in high school um so how many (laughs) siblings did you have or, or do you have yeah, I have um, two sisters, two older sisters, and mm-hmm. a brother. Okay. And so you are you the youngest, or is your brother younger than you? Yeah. Okay. No, I'm the youngest. Okay. I'm always curious about birth order and how it, you know, sort of sets people up. And so I, I will make a generalization that may or may not be true, but uh, you definitely strike me as a free spirit. And I feel like uh, sometimes being the youngest means maybe your parents were paying a little less attention. So you are like free to explore maybe more. Oh, definitely. I was definitely the weird one, <laughs> the one that's not like anyone else. I was a late bloomer. I was real soft, you know, so I was always crying. Mm. My older siblings were so cool and popular in school. So it helped me out because I was so soft that I was already cool Mm. because of their reputations. Mm -hmm. My older sister was a big time basketball player. Mm -hmm. So she, she was like my idol, you know, she's the first one in my family to go to college. And she went to a, North Carolina a and like a historical black college. Mm-hmm. So I was, we would go visit and watch her games, and I just loved it. You know, I remember going to into the locker room and singing all these super tall women, and they were strong, and I just was amazed by that, you know? Yeah. Well, speaking of, when you said you, you played basketball, I mean, I know you to be a kind of slight person. So is your sister a similar sized person? And, and how did you all sort of fare as basketball players? Oh, everyone was really good. Okay. My father was good. My Everyone was good. So, um, yeah, I, I'm the smallest. Mm-hmm. But I'm pretty wild <laughs> when I play. I'm kind of like a Dennis Rodman. Got it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, so... But I was never, I don't think I would say I was better than my siblings Mm -hmm. because I was a little, um, I was a little bad, I guess you could say, especially once I couldn't play basketball that year. That was really like a turning point for me. Mm -hmm. So I struggled, I struggled through school and, um, you know, was into hip, I was rapping with a little hip hop group and, you know, just, I would like punk rock, so I was just different. I mean, pretty much different than the whole neighborhood, to be honest, but because of this reputation that my siblings had, they accepted me, mm-hmm. you know? Some kids would say, oh, you're just in a phase, Kame, it's okay, you know, things like that. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, I don't know. <laughs> um, your first and last name, mm-hmm. and you don't have to tell me, but I'm just curious, is it your birth name, Kame Ayewa, or is Ayewa adopted later? And I'm, I'm only asking because I was trying to figure out its origins. Yeah, it's adopted later. It's actually from Ghana tradition of being named after the day of the week that you were born. Mm-hmm. And I was born on a Thursday. So I, I, I took that name because this idea, especially what we do in, you know, thinking about futurism and black money futurism, this idea of how we're connected 
you know, way further than just, you know, our family, the family that we meet and see, you know, that yeah. we stretch so far back and we're connected. So, you know, inspired by Amiri Baraka, of course, one of my favorite poets, I took that on. And where did your parents get Kame from? I always think about the soap that my grandmother used to have around. Yeah, <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah no, I was always happy about that soap when I was a kid. <laughs> um, my father made it up, and uh, it's a piece of my grandmother's name. Mm. Her name is Ella May. Mm-hmm. And so um, since I was the, like the last baby, and my mom always says I wasn't planned, so they really named me after everybody. Okay. <laughs> so I got two, I got two grandmothers in my name. I got my godmother, my aunt. Mm-hmm. You know, I was kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> that little baby. Yeah. So you initially studied photography in college, and I was wondering if mm-hmm. you were still interested in making images. Oh, I'm definitely interested. I was going to 2020, since I had all that time on my hands, make a photo book. But I got so wrapped up in making all this music, but I'm not going outside as much as I thought I would. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's definitely a plan for me to release an art book that's just images. And I also do collage. So I want to do a mix of that. When would you say you began experimenting with your voice in performance? I would say around the Black Lily era of time. I was trying to not even think about music when I came to college. Mm -hmm. I was really trying hard. And then um, a friend of mine caught me writing some graffiti in Philly and was like, oh, you should come to this party, you know, this kind of thing. And I was really trying to stay away from it. But there were some women there that were rapping and they were good. And I was like, wait a minute now. You know, I'm good, too. And I would (laughs) rap and I would meet all my friends in Philly, like pretty much that night. And it wouldn't be soon after that where I would be starting rap groups and sneaking in the Black Lily Mm -hmm. to do my little rap, you know. (laughs) (laughs) I read that you had a rap group with friends in high school called Sister Soldier. And then later Mm -hmm. you discovered reggae and ska and punk. And I was curious, who were some of the musicians who were, you know, kind of formative for you in in those teenage years? I feel like that's really what settles in your soul. So who are those musicians Mm -hmm. you um, discovered early on? I kind of split it into the dark part and the light part, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, we're listening to hip hop with DMX and noriega you know and all that stuff was telling telling us like alcohol alcohol you know that kind of (laughs) stuff you know i i loved it but it was definitely a a negative influence for me at that time yeah even though i connected to the lyrics and stuff like that i really liked noriega but then on the other side i mean i still love this uh, bob marley guy and i was searching for more music like that you know, because I wasn't, I didn't grow up in a neighborhood where I could go to a friend and be like, hey, you heard the new Green Day or, you know, Nirvana or, you know, this kind of thing. So I really had to um, just watch all those kind of documentaries I could find on TV and learn about the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. And there's, and there's still stuff that I didn't know about, like bad brains. Yeah, I wouldn't know about them so much later, and they were right in D.C. Yeah. That could have saved a lot of stuff for me. <laughs> um, also, Nina Simone. Mm-hmm. Then find out about Nina Simone. So after college, that would have saved a lot for me. Things like that. But I love uh, Patti LaBelle, like Power Voices. Yeah, My family is like a Patti LaBelle stand family. <laughs> So I I had a lot of chances to see uh, Patti LaBelle, also like Public Enemy and anything black, real black, African. And my parents would take me to and whoever was performing there, Mm -hmm. especially in Baltimore, was always good. Because, you know, Baltimore, we don't like play, (laughs) you know, like (laughs) you've got to be real good. We don't want to see nothing else but greatness. Yeah. 
I, I think about for myself, and I might be a little bit older than you, but music videos and college radio were my portal into hip hop and alternative music in the 90s. And I was wondering if there were for you was like a singular music video or artist whose videos are imprinted on your brain. Because I think about for myself, it's like De La Soul's Buddy remix, like being introduced oh to the native gosh. tongues. <laughs> you know, like Ugh. I took all my visual cues and so much from that moment. <laughs> Um, what what was it for you? I would definitely say that buddy track. I definitely would say scenario. Mm -hmm. Also, anything MC light. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just going back and forth with that one dude, or just like poor Georgie. Oh yeah. Really, women was really cool. Yo Yo and mm -hmm. Salt and Pepper was huge. Yeah. Salt and Pepper, Kid and Play, anything that had also that those rhythms that I can relate to, mm -hmm. like that go-go. Uh, but I have uh, um, an uncle who was a concert promoter in Syracuse, New York. He would take me to, when we would go visit for the summer, my sister and I, take us to see all the hip-hop concerts, so the Fat Boys. So this is something that I always was tuned into very young. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like, I can't, I can't remember when we met exactly, but... I think, and let me know if this is not true, because I feel like things just get conflated in the mind, but I think Walida and Marisha and I were organizing this series of black rock shows at the Rotunda, and I yes. think we booked Mighty Paradox. Is that true? <laughs> Do you mm -hmm. Okay. That's true. That's 100% okay. true. Well, I wanted to ask you, how did Mighty Paradox begin? Really, uh, like I was saying earlier, that house party. Mm -hmm. um, one of the women that were rapping was the other vocalist that would be in the Mighty Paradox. Okay. So we uh, said, "Hey, let's you know, let's hang out in our dorm and just rap." And we put on uh, Trap Called Quest, the um, love, the love movement. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it's called, love movement. Yeah. And we rapped that. We rapped this freestyle that whole album. And we were like, I think we got something here. And just, we were the duo, but I had always had these dreams of punk rock, you know? Mm -hmm. and, I would, and I would show her all these mu music that I like and show my friends in Philly. And then it was just like, okay, if we can find a band somehow, we're gonna do it. And that was always on my mind, but it was hard, you know? It was so many MCs, not a lot of musicians that I knew. And I remember I saw this kid with a huge afro and a bass guitar on CCP Community College mm -hmm. of Philadelphia's campus. And I just went right up to this kid. And I said, hey, you know, I've been trying to start a band. What's up? And they were like, I literally just came to the community college for someone to stop me and say that, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is perfect, <laughs> you know? It, it, that's incredible, too, because earlier you were talking about Black Lily, and I think about what it must have been like for you to be in this punk band when so much of Philly was focused on Neo Soul. What was it like performing, you know, around town when everyone was kind of not only focused on that, but, you know, coming to the city, people coming from all over to go to Black Lily and to, you know, sort of soak up mm -hmm. that scene? What was what was that like for you? I know there were other there were a few other punk outfits that I can think of, but what was your experience? Well, no, th that was it. Three seven thousand and nine, you know, that was the time when we had that moment to break out. Yeah, but like like I said about Patti LaBelle, like Jaguar is pretty punk rock. <laughs> That's <laughs> you <know>? true. Like, <laughs> are you kidding me? Yeah, you know, and the the acts got real smoother over time. But those first couple acts, they were so punk, mm -hmm. so much attitude and like empowerment. It was the women of Black Lily. That was it. Yeah. You know, then you had Flo Brown where you can see yourself. Yeah. And then, of course, the Jazzy Fat Nasties. Yeah. You know, like you wanted, like I didn't really want to impress anyone else except the Jazzy Fat Nasties. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a time where I couldn't even pull my hand out of my pocket. That's how <laughs> nervous I was, but I knew I had to do it, you know? Yeah. And I had this song called All About the Pussy. <laughs> Nowadays, it's all about the pussy, pussy, mm -hmm. pussy. People doing this for the pussy. And 
I remember I shook up Black Lily, <laughs> you know, and Mercedes came on the mic and was like, "Woo! nowadays it's all about the, pl-, you know, and I was like, <laughs> whoa, I didn't even know it was radical, you know, because MCs, we just sit around just rapping, yeah. you know, so I was like, whoa, I felt like I did something radical tonight. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't, it was just more motivation to like, okay, start your own thing, you know. Yeah. Well, speaking of, you founded and curated Rockers Philly for Mm -hmm. about a decade. Uh, Can you tell us what Rockers was for people who don't know and what made you start it? I mean, just like we're talking, coming from Black Lily, doing something that's a bit more political. Mm -hmm. A lot of the lyrics were about love and finding love and searching and for your, you know, empowerment of self. But it wasn't too much political at Black Lily. Mm hmm. And so I wanted something where folks could just be pissed at George Bush or be pissed at the systems or be pissed about the move bombing, you know, because there's so much of this activism that we were all getting into. So I just wanted a space where we all could just do that. And that's what it was for all the kind of like weirdos, oddballs. Yeah. But it would it would serve as a platform to where they're all no longer those weirdos. You know, they're like sophisticated in the ideas that they want to bring forth. Yeah. And I think that was like the most important thing for them, but also for me, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. You need those, those spaces, right. To hone your craft and to uh, connect with audiences and for audiences to find themselves, you know, so it's super, super important. Yeah. Yeah. You began More Mother as a solo project around 2012, and I wanted you to talk a little bit about what the initial impulse was in debuting that project. Oh, it was just like I was in this band, and it was five people, and I wanted to just keep on creating. Because, you know, like when you're in a band, you, you meet for band practice, mm-hmm. and then you get some ideas out, and then you say, bye see you next week or maybe we can see each other again this week you know so it's like i had all this creativity just inside me all this stuff i wanted to do so i just ended up making like hundreds of uh beats trying to get good it kind of just snowballed from there i was also testing out more mother so i did these beats alone so i could constantly work on something But then live, I would test it out, like play guitar, have a drummer, sometimes have a band, you know, just keep testing out how I wanted this more mother to be live versus like home studio kind of thing. And a couple of years later, you and DJ Haram launched the Experimental Club Project 700 Bliss. And then Mm -hmm. a year later, you co-founded the Free Jazz Collective Irreversible Entanglement. So it's interesting kind of like reading about you, what was coming to mind for me were, uh, it it was like you're a contemporary version of these old school jazz musicians from the 70s, you know, who are kind of like in a bunch of outfits, pursuing liberation on kind of all the things, you know, I think about mm-hmm. Milford Graves, right? <laughs> who was like, yeah, has his own martial arts practice, right? Is like dedicated to spirituality, mm-hmm. holistic living, and then of course is playing in different bands and then also tinkering. And yeah, I just feel like you're like the contemporary version of those folks. And I just wanted to ask you, like, how did you get to be this free? Oh, I think I'm still moving to get free, you know? Um, I never had any kind of vocal training. So it's just about myself pushing myself to go further and further to where I want to go. Because, uh, like I said, my favorite singers are like Patti LaBelle. <laughs> I can't get to, I can't get to Patti LaBelle. So I want to <laughs> get as close as, as I can. to what that means for me Yeah, to be able to just be, continue to be more and more free with the voice. So it, it's, it's definitely hard, but like you mentioned, Milford Graves, seeing someone like that is so inspirational to me to say that, you know, it's okay to be on the journey, yeah. you know, and that's just, you know, beautiful. Uh, when I was asking about the musicians as a teenager, but I imagine there's other musicians that you've discovered and you talk a bit about Alice Coltrane. I was wondering too, if Michelle and Cello has any, um, you know, influence on you. 
oh my goodness you don't even know okay <laughs> like i almost cried over like thinking does michelle like me or not some mutual friend was like oh i think michelle should hear your music mm -hmm. you know and i was like what well i'm uh, and i guess it was a time where you know which was a really busy time and i didn't really get anything back uh, i think michelle said i'll check it out you know but i didn't hear anything mm -hmm. so i didn't say anything you know because this is someone that's so huge to me but it was i would think about it all the time yeah. oh man i'm too aggressive or i'm too this i'm too that you know um so just recently i don't know if it was like two weeks ago mm. i just couldn't take it you know i'm just <laughs> like i love michelle so much and i was playing in rotterdam in the netherlands and i saw a poster that michelle was coming to play the same venue the next week mm. i just went on their instagram and, and i just wrote you're so cool and they were like they wrote back and said i'm gonna write a baseline for you oh wow and i just lost my <laughs> mind i don't even so i'm a oh uh, i'm a big fan of things yeah we've been going through you know just sort of a, a brief overview of your career and i want to talk about black quantum futurism but i also want to back up a bit and ask how did you meet rashida phillips this was a time when people had blogs mm -hmm. a mutual friend of ours was like hey you two blogs are really similar y'all should you know talk to each other so yeah so like once we saw each other's blog we were like oh my goodness you know <laughs> like this is great it was like it was curated for both of us you know mm -hmm. um so we would meet up and they would start coming to rockers and they had this um started this event called the afro futures affair and I had a, had all these kind of wild futurist artists. And so I would help curate that, uh, one of the first ones. And then from there, it was just the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, real easy, mm -hmm. you know, because we had this kind of shared interest. And Rashida knew more on the science part, and I was knew a bit more in the spiritual part. Mm -hmm. So that really um, opens up a lot of com good conversations. Yeah. Well, I'm curious, did you collaborate as colleagues and artists first, or did you begin your relationship as sweethearts? As colleagues? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I'm a little blurry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's blurry. But I think it colleagues, colleagues first. Yeah. And what what has it been like navigating you know, your lives as artistic partners in black quantum futurism. And then also I imagine as, and forgive me if I'm over speaking, but as domestic partners as well. Rashid is just so smart, you know, and I love that, you know, like I said, I'm big into learning. So it's, it's real nice how easily we fit, mm. but then we have different tacks of how we get things done. Mm -hmm. You know, me being a primarily creative and Rashida having experience being a lawyer and like a really good one at that. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. So, um, you know, we, we learn stuff from each other. I learn how to not take any crap. And I think Rashida learns how to just um, go with the flow a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. The fact that I'm an idea kind of person and Rashida is such a great writer, you know, so we can just go you know it's kind of like popcorn mm -hmm. that kind of thing once we get an idea we're just like boom 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 mm -hmm. you know and it's kind of done but it's always learning about balancing all the opportunities and just with the traveling and just learning how to set better boundaries for yourself yeah and i mean i love that i love whenever i can be like you know what i am not going to eastern or whatever town you know what i mean like i don't need to be there i don't i'm <laughs> gonna just do two weeks of tour and i'm coming back home you know these just kind of things of creating sustainability because that's a big part about our work in black quantum futurism we don't like to just feel rented or flash here and never return 
Yeah. I like to develop foundations with people and be a part of something, not just in and out. Now we both really share that, and I, and that's really uh, a really cool thing that uh, steers us. Well, what led to the establishment of BQ, BQF? Like there are continuous projects. Rashida had wrote this book called The Current Plot and Other Time Travel Time Travel Tales. And I did the kind of soundtrack to that. And it was just so good. We just said, okay, what's you know, what else? And so and then having this community of a lot of folks making shows and putting on events, you know, it was just kind of no ceiling. Yeah. I've read in the past, you've said that the Black Quantum Futurism Collective, and quote, focuses on recovery, collection, and preservation of communal memories, histories, and stories. The past and future are not cut off from the present. Both dimensions have influence over our lives, who we are, and who we become at any particular point in space-time. And that, end quote, and that it is also, quote, a new language of healing, memory, and justice that can be transmitted and used as a technology. And I was wondering, is this yeah. still an accurate description of the work, or is it always shifting and transforming? No, that's the roots. That is the roots of what we do. It's all about the place where we are. We don't like to put things upon people. Mm-hmm. You can understand that. You know, we like to be like, okay, the city, the town, all these places, the earth has so much history. We like to pull from that you know, and look at how we are in these positions and also, you know, the power of speculation, the Mm -hmm. power to redefine these kind of set objects that they've put in front of us. You know, we have this project that's talking about time capsules and about, we call it a quantum time capsule that you can send information in the future or you can send it back in the past. And it's everyday objects, you know, it's, it's um, the Afro pick, you know, it's these different ways of, of, of repurposing clocks. It's these kind of stones, you know, we found that enslaved people underneath their um, their home, their shack, their cabin, their, their enslaved quarters that they were living in, they had this kind of underneath, you know, uh, hidden place where they had these kind of objects that looked like ordinary objects to, you know, colonialists, but to us, it was a technology, Mm -hmm. you know, it was how to pass down a story. Yeah. You know, it's like in a simple thing that so many black women can relate to is like the idea of the hot comb. Yeah. We all see that hot comb and it doesn't just say straight hair. It's a history with that, you know? It's like your aunt is sitting between those legs. Mm-hmm. It's your, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. It's your Easter hair Sunday. Texture, all this, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All this stuff comes up. Mm-hmm. And so we look at that, you know? We look at these ideas of time, too, and see how they've been oppressive and how they steer our lives. Black Star Projects celebrates and uplifts Black, Brown, and Indigenous artists. We produce the annual Black Star Film Festival, many lumens, scene, and other projects creating the spaces and resources artists need to thrive. Learn more and support our work at blackstarfest.org. You're listening to Many Lumens, and now back to my conversation with Kame Ayewa. I want to backtrack just a little bit. I'm really fascinated by names and the process of naming because uh, just like you've just mentioned, you know, redefining and redefinition, it is, you know, a power that I think black people in this country in particular have um, held dear. You know, you think about the names people gave themselves when bondage ended um, and Freeman and people naming themselves George Washington and Lincoln, you know what I mean, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And also the names, I mean, I never forget, uh, once I understood in Daughters of the Dust, the scene uh, where Hagar is going over the names of the daughters and it's I own her and, you know, my own Mm -hmm. and just thinking about, yeah, just that sheer power. And then, of course, you think about someone like Amiri Baraka um, and his contemporaries 
who named themselves, you know, were redefined who right. they were. Um, Abby Lincoln, you know, we could we could keep going. And so many mm-hmm. people um, when I was coming of age were also naming themselves either, you know, their MC names, but also many times a new chosen name. And so I changed my name first at eight because <laughs> I just never liked wow. my name. And then I kind of officially <laughs> changed it to Maori when I was 16. And wow. um I was just curious for you. You've got a lot of personas. There's more mother, more mother goddess, Kame Death Star, Kame Ayewa, Kame Dennis, Sam Stamina. How do you come to your names and how do you release them? It's more about what I want to honor. Mm. I love this idea of the legacy. I just sat and said, well, what's the most important thing to me? You know, whether it's politically or like my heart, like what am I, what I care about? You know, I just come from so many just strong women in my community and my family. Mm-hmm. Blessed to be able to spend time with my great grandmother, not just my grandmother, you know. So I just I just want to honor mothers to just see what mothers do all over the world. It's something that I really wanted to honor yeah. and share those stories. So I made an assumption, but d- then didn't find it in the research. And so I wanted to ask, does more mother have anything to do with Queen Mother more? No. Okay. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't find out about her until later. Oh, wow. Which was also one of these weird things, you wow. know? Yeah. And I just remember feeling proud. Yeah, you did good, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can you talk about when you discovered the concept of Afrofuturism? I would say that would be through Rashida. Mm -hmm. And I was always doing this Afrofuturism. I just didn't know it in the academic kind of journalist world. It would be Rashida. But as soon as I learned about Afrofuturism, we were already going to Black quantum futurism. You know, of saying like, okay, we get it that it was coined from this white man that was trying to write a little article on what all these amazing artists were doing. But I grew up in that kind of world, you know, so it was always kind of this, this futurism, this seeking, this, uh, you know, and that also comes from spirituals growing up in the kind of church I did, you know, it was always, we're going to win, you know, victory is mine. Yeah, it was (laughs) never like, you know, not not to diss other gospel music, but that type of music that I was, you know, around was just so uplifting. Yeah. I hear a lot of influences in your work. I think I've been asking you previously about influences on your thinking. And so mm-hmm. sonically, what would you say the influences are on kind of your sonic foundation? I mean, definitely a Mary Baraka, mm-hmm. definitely Sonia Sanchez. Mm-hmm. Sonia Ch- Sanchez is everything to me. Yeah, I don't even know what to say. Jazz, blues nothing you know and then the haikus oh my goodness just endless and the po in the plays and just the organ organizing and just ah oh, yeah big huge inspiration um another one that i found out later would be lonnie holly mm-hmm. huge inspiration like someone that can keep me tied to home that's, you know, and those are the artists I like. I love that you said tied to home because my next question, and no lie, <laughs> is as someone who travels constantly and has lived in several places, where and what do you consider home? I mean, Washington Park. Mm-hmm. Even though it's like it was torn down and rebuilt, you know how they do that kind of thing. Yeah. But that's so rich. It's so fresh paint in my mind, you know? Mm. And like I said, if I'm on the plane, when I that's when I tend to get a little melancholy with all the thoughts in my head. I put on the Lonnie Holly and boom, like I know where I'm going. Mm-hmm. Things that kind of tie me, it's what I need. It's what I'm searching for in all the music I want to listen to. So this, of course, you know, you being a poet um, and an MC, it would make sense that your practice would prioritize language and mm-hmm. I was wondering how you employ your voice as an instrument. 
Well, for a long time, I was obsessed with synthesizers, and I thought that was what was the thing that mm -hmm. I was bringing forth. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I just so many alarms kept going off being like, it's about what you say. You know, it's the poetry. Like, I make one poetry book, that's three albums. Mm. So it's really, you know, the voice. And I just see it every time, you know. So like I said before, it's about kind of pushing that, being more experimental, being a bit more free for myself. Mm -hmm. And also setting it up, you know, this kind of thing of this making boundaries as I was talking about earlier just setting yourself up for success you know and that's kind of what i'm trying to do vocally continue setting myself up whether it's the sonic structure that's behind me or the samples that guide me everything is just to make me relax so i can go as deep with my voice as possible mm. so i understand that you play bass drums and various mm -hmm. electronic devices um, of these, electronic seems to be the most expansive and plastic of these tools. And I was curious, what are some of the electronic tools and capabilities that you seek to continue using? Yeah, well, I mean, I want to take some piano lessons. That's mm -hmm. like my um, calming instrument. It really relaxes me. I, I play any synthesizers. I don't like to read a manual. I just like to take it out the box and start pressing buttons <laughs> and just hit record, you know, because like I said, once I learned that the voice was the most important thing for me, it didn't really matter what's not like I don't care about what the sound sounds like, but as long as I have these kind of ingredients and I want all my music to have the blues, gospel and jazz, it's particularly free jazz. As long as I keep those elements in there and stay true to myself, I, it's fine. You're in a lot of electronic music spaces, I imagine. And mm -hmm. I also imagine that there are not a lot of Black women in, in that space. And so how do you, mm -hmm. how did you find yourself here? Yeah, I think it's because of like my love for history that I don't have this kind of feeling of not belonging mm. that I, I know a lot of musicians have. Mm -hmm. You know, when I first started, I'm like, wow, I want to know about all the places that black women have been in, in the world. Cause I know it's been a lot, you know, I don't kind of have this narrow or restricted point about where we've been. Mm -hmm. And this, these examples keep popping up. Like when I first started, I was real popular in Poland. Mm -hmm. And I could not understand why was I popular in Poland, you know? Like, <laughs> they were like, Black Madonna. The, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, I'm like doing a gig in Berlin and they're like, yeah, the Polish newspaper's here that they want to talk to you. I'm like, I'm not even in Poland. What is going on? <laughs> and then I would learn that W.E.B. Du Bois spent a lot of time over there studying the ghettos. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, with my work with Rashida, we do a lot of ha housing advocacy and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, OK, I see that connection mm -hmm. and I always feel it. So it's just like, oh, I felt Nina Simone. Did Nina Simone play here? And they're like, yeah. Mm -hmm. or, you know, it's always like these connections. And I'm so blessed with all the work and sacrifice those before me, all the musicians and poets, they covered a lot of territory, creating these kind of movements, this kind of hunger in people, you know, and I feel like I'm picking that up, you know, from a lot of the 60s and 70s experimental jazz, you know, because people come and tell me these stories, you know, they're like, I saw blah, blah, blah in 67. And you know what? You were bringing that fight, you know? So yeah. <laughs> I, I like that. You talked a lot in other podcasts and interviews and documentaries and things about the use of sound as a tool of resistance. And I was curious mm -hmm. if you've trained in other modalities using sound. Is, is Do you have any experience with sound bowls or oh, breath work yeah. or you oh, know, chanting? Yeah. A, a lot. Um, I've been big into meditation. Um, for a long time and um also just like um different kind of humming like i like to mix a bit a bit because like i told you this african methodist church 
mm -hmm. that I uh, grew up in, they had this, the early songs were the women of the church would go around like someone that was in their sick bed. I guess now we call it like hospice. Mm -hmm. And they would do this kind of humming singing, you know? So I really like this kind of, um, these humming tones, you know, that, that take us to, take us safely to another place. Yeah. It was an old tale where they would say that we're singing these kind of, uh, these songs. So when you're going towards the white light or however you want to call this passing away, that the, the bad energies don't come and get you. Mm -hmm. You know, that the tones or the demons or whatever kind of uh, archetype you want to believe that they don't come and snatch your soul and your soul's going to the correct place. So I kind of like these tones. I'm really into Tai Chi and um, Qigong, these kind of pushing the air, the space around you, using, you know, getting rid of air within your body and also making sounds that are tuned to the environment that you're at. Mm -hmm. You know, I was living in North Philly, you know, so there's, there's construction, there's all kinds of sounds. Yeah. So to be able to sit in meditation and pull these sounds into your own sound that's in your body, you know, um, something that I will, I would do. So a lot of like ohms, that kind of thing. I've always loved prayer always love the idea that prayer is not one thing mm -hmm. and to me uh sound is waves um sound is, is its own event so there's this kind of way that you can in interact with your environment to do these kind of ohms that you can bring these events together so that's just another thing of this idea of that we're not cut off you know, these sounds echo through existence. Yeah. Um, they're they're tied to, you know, our family legacies, our legacies of liberation. One thing I think about a lot is bells that I like to use. Bells have this really history that's light and dark in this kind of maddening way of Christianity, you know, um, being tied to war. And coming into communities, regulating them with the bell. Right. If we're thinking about plantation time, you mm -hmm. know, so these, these kind of things of ways that, you know, sound has always been there and how it's traveled. And so, yeah, I'm totally into that uh, spiritual aspect. Collectives seem to be a constant presence in your life. You've worked with Art Ensemble of Chicago, of course, Black quantum futurism, and recently the Pan-African People's Orchestra. What is it mm -hmm. like performing with collectives versus bands? Or is there a difference? It's not a difference. Uh, one thing that's like different from like my free jazz band and then working with the art ensemble, you know, you have this idea of being respectful and listening to everyone and kind of having this place in history, you know, or in the future. But they always push push me more and more, you know, the collaborations uh, with these collectives. They always push me more. And, you know, like something Roscoe was like, I didn't bring you on here to be scared. I brought <laughs> you on here to do what you're going to do, what I saw you do, mm -hmm. you know? So that's just like really cool to have people like, oh, you're not just a poet. We're not just here for you to say these couple words. You know, we're here to like put the fire under those words. You say more. And the idea of there's no master, like it's a student to student learning. Yeah. You've collaborated and performed with, you know, so many luminaries. There's L London Contemporary Orchestra, King Brit, Vijay Iyer. Um, you just men mentioned Roscoe Mitchell. And I imagine you get approached often. And I was just wondering, how do you decide with whom you'll journey? You know, what is it that you're looking for when you're approached to collaborate on something? I'm pretty easy. Like, you're a black woman. Come on. You know, <laughs> I'm going to do it. <laughs> if you're an elder, I love working with elders. And I've all, I will always be gracious 
that they they reach out to me because you know when you first start i thought i was just going to be do, jumping in mosh pits because you know in philly i had my own thing so that's what it looked like in philly so i thought that that's what it would be in the world but it was a lot of elders coming to me and i'm like oh that kind of makes sense too because philly is a big kind of elders will always come in and jam with us yeah so it kind of made sense a little later um a few of your past projects have engaged archival materials thinking about the great bailout um your marian anderson mm-hmm. work um you know even some of your projects have created archives at community futures lab do you have any archival mm-hmm. research projects currently in the works oh yes always always <laughs> um uh, Rashid and I, we just recently was awarded the Creative Capital Award, and we're going to um, travel to the Confederate States in America and create an album and do a lot of research of a lot of the um, all Black towns that were destroyed. So I'm really looking forward to that because, like I said, I love history, and the South is just like a walking history book every single place. And especially for a poet, you know, because the trees are like screaming at you, the plant, you know, like everything is so electric. I kind of been just really working on getting this um, book out um, where it's just me writing poetry about all the uh, musicians, particularly jazz and blues musicians that have inspired me Mm -hmm. um, by just their story, not like the music. Um, it's very few kind of music poems that I have in there. Most of it is about their life, you know, and how that made an impression on me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I want to get that out and I hope to be able to bring more books forward. You know, I, that's something that I'm really interested in is book bookmaking and bringing some of these kind of research ideas forward. Yeah. I want to ask you a switch to kind of like a fun question. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But how did you settle on your look? I have a look? Yeah, you have a Whoa. look. You know, you have that's cool. long locks. You're always dressed really cool. Like, you know, did, did you not think about it? Is this just, it's just you? No, it's no, it's something that I, I never really adorned myself. And I think that's kind of like a little bit of the Bob Marley influence. I kind of just like this natural thing. Mm-hmm. But then slowly but surely uh, had a tour. I, I was touring a lot. And I was just doing all these amazing things and I had no way I wasn't marking it. It was just all coming to be a blur. And so I had this big concert at the Berlin Jazz Festival where they like took the a, t- a, a line from my poem and made that the title of the of the festival and I would perform with Roscoe Mitchell for the first time, then with the art ensemble, then my own band. So I was like a triple header. Mm. It was like a big deal. And the night before that, I was in Italy and I got um, attacked by some bugs in a bed, Mm. you know? So this is like right before this huge show. And I'm feeling, I kept calling myself the hunchback of Notre Dame Mm. You know, I was like, they got me. I something, you know, just like frustrated. <laughs> I was just so down and I needed to pick myself up. So I went to the Gucci store <laughs> and I just um I just bought a Gucci bag, you know? I never even had a purse or nothing. <laughs> I just bought this bag and was like, I'm gonna look cool, you know, and I got a nice shirt and I think that was kind of like this opening to now, like when I do a big tour, Mm -hmm. I would always buy myself a nice thing. Mm -hmm. So slowly I've been getting an idea and I love, um, like I love basketball, but I love Russell Westbrook. Mm -hmm. That's like one of my style minions or something, you know, or (laughs) I don't know how people call that style inspo or something. Yeah, I like him. Of course, I like Kanye West. I don't even know if I'm allowed to say that, but I like (laughs) Kanye West. You know, style, you know, when it comes to style. Yeah. So, you know, and I love um, tailored look. I like uh, pearls and silk scarves and, you know, and like nice fitted pants and stuff like this. So Mm -hmm. 
I guess I yeah I've turned into this kind of thing, but um, but touring is really the main thing that shaped that. You know, I wear hoodies less because of how I'm perceived mm. in any kind of airports. Uh, really, pretty much anywhere um, I'm wrongly perceived. Um, you know, some people think that I'm a man. You mm. know, so I get this kind of action of people coming to me as a man kind of thing or confused or this kind of thing uh, pretty much every day mm. you know so um that also would have something to say because um i'm gonna move through the world how i want to yeah so i gotta stay safe in the choices that i make for myself mm -hmm. you know so that also i noticed that change um and i'm also like a foodie <laughs> you know, so like um, like Michelin star, I like really good food. Mm -hmm. So I'm walking in these places where someone like me wouldn't be. Yeah. Or shouldn't even know about. It's like they're like, oh, this is private food news. How do you know? And I'm like, I'm up on the food news. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I'm a foodie. I'm not just like I know your name. Right. You know what I mean? This right. kind of thing. And I love boutique hotels also. Mm hmm. I love, uh, you know, hotels that may be less than 30 rooms or 40 rooms, this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so when I'm in these places that I am typically, I guess, not supposed to be in, I notice how it changed. I noticed when I got that Gucci bag, it wasn't, no, it, it was less drama, yeah. you know? Yeah. But one more thing I would say about this, I had a prerequisite when I was coaching at the private school in Philly and mm -hmm. Friends Select, I was coaching soccer and I didn't really grow up playing soccer. Okay. So I never had a soccer outfit with the Adidas and all of this. So finally, I think it was like my third year coaching soccer. I went to Models and I got the outfit, mm -hmm. you know, the Adidas shorts, the shirt, the shoes. Yeah. And I remember walking out in that field and everybody said hi to me. Like everybody was not like, who's this Rasta coaching from <laughs> Philly? You know what I mean? It was more like, hello, coach. Yeah. You know, like I was a part of a club just because I had the Adidas outfit, you yeah. know, and this idea of dressing for the job you want or this idea. I never liked that kind of thing. Yeah. But I saw the, the change. Yeah. It, it it's it's an incredible uh, to witness it. I I've worked I've worked retail and uh, studied costume design, and I'm with you. Like I hate it, <laughs> you know. I don't want to adhere to it. But then when you experience it, it's like such a thing. Um, the way that people respect you, and it's sort of like you know, for femme folks, lipstick. <laughs> you know what I mean? It like it changes. Okay. Everything, and particularly red lipstick, mm -hmm. like the way that people respond to you. I mean, it's interesting hearing you talk about like having the Gucci bag because I would imagine with your hair, you look like a rock star, but that's me putting that on that. And it's like, you probably have to have these other things for other people to see you as a rock star. So that's really interesting. Oh uh, yeah. I mean, and like I said, after you got to perform. Yeah. You know, so like any kind of judgment they had after I perform, then I would usually see that this but yeah. when I go in with the outfit already, you know. Yeah. But um, just yesterday, the guy in Uganda said, if you have locks in Uganda, people would think that you're well off because you can't get a regular job with locks. Right. So if you, you know, if you have them, it's like, oh, that must be a rock star. Right. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, whoa, it's so interesting wherever you are, what it means. Yeah. You know, this this next question is um, sort of related to some of the things you've already revealed, but your work explores so many heavy topics. And I wanted to ask you, where do you find joy and how do you unplug? Like I said, I like to treat every part of my life as creativity. Mm -hmm. So um, I love flowers. Mm. Like I am always in a flower space. Like whether I'm is in my home, there's tons of flowers. Whether I'm walking in the street, I like stop. I'm like that kid that stops and smells flowers like through the, the whole walk. Um, I love crystals. 
and water and birds. I've just been getting into birds. Like I've been feeding them and I just, you know, I love, I love like little animals and just, um, trying to take care of them or I, or just caring for them, you know, like, um, I know it sounds like a hippie, like, but I like carry around little things, yeah. you know, like if I see a little animal or something, I'll try to give it to it. But I also do it with kids. Like I carry around dollar bills. And if I see a cute kid, I'm like, I give your kid, the, you know, not like people that are my friends, but I'm just like, I got a dollar for you or I got a toy. Like, yeah, I kind of like that, that aspect of when I go out and take a walk, you know? Mm-hmm. of these little small moments of helping and eating mm-hmm. i eat a lot you know i go to a city i'll eat at four restaurants at least <laughs> in a day so yeah i love that i love that kind of stuff so i'm surrounded by the stuff that i love yeah i am getting to the end i don't want to totally like okay take all your time today but um i do want to ask you for whom do you make work I make work for uh, uh, the liberation of marginalized people. Mm. I create work to lift the voices of women. I create work to reveal what's been stolen or taken or forgotten from our histories as Africans, as indigenous people. And always, it's always a travel. It's like time travel. It's always to get to a place where I can do more within my own self, not with uh, external things, you know? Yeah. This year has been a busy one. Uh, With Black Mm -hmm. Quantum Futurism, you've had an exhibition at Red Cat, you're a documenta, you released Nothing to Declare with 700 Bliss, and after the airing of this episode, you'll have released Jazz Codes as More Mother, Mm -hmm. and you also began teaching at USC. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) I want to ask you how you do it, but I know that is like a pot kettle question, but (laughs) yeah, I mean, it's, it's like you're nonstop. And I was wondering if you would ever imagine that you'd be teaching at the university level. No, after I finished with friends select, I didn't think I would get a job again. Mm. I never even looked at a job because I was already doing so well with what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So, um, really it's the love of writing poetry Hmm. you know um i can't write fast enough or enough you know as soon as i write something boom it's gone somewhere you know so i i would say that kind of love with poetry keeps me and i you know i feel like i can do so much more it's also like you know just keep learning from the experiences Mm -hmm. and use that not just have it you know yeah You were based in Philadelphia for a really long time, and you've now Mm -hmm. relocated to Los Angeles. And I've gone back and forth between the two cities myself. And there's something, you know, kind of magical and kind of funky about both. And I rather like dividing my time between the two. But I was curious, how is L.A. suiting you right now? Oh, it's really nice. It's just expensive, (laughs) you know, but um, it's really nice. I love to be able to walk around and see the sunset and go to the beach and i just love the sunlight that's what i really like but i also love you know philly the energy that kind of sticks with you yeah so i like having that energy in la you know like i'm ready to go (laughs) you know (laughs) yeah you've done so much you're doing so much are there any other disciplines that you're hoping to explore in this lifetime you know, is there a film that you want to direct or, yeah, is there anything else you're planning to explore? Food? Yeah, yeah, besides food. Yeah, I mean, all of these things that I love, I really love them. I hope to open up a restaurant one day, something small. I love film. I want to do so much more. Like, um, I was checking out some of the things that uh, Laurie Anderson or just like taking a look at it. And I wish I kind of had this chance do some one woman shows that are like recorded and you know those kind of things i want to make this kind of experimental film life of that is um a direct response to what i'm doing musically 
and have these kind of longer intimate moments where people can see and rewind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to do that and I want to create more books and do some more painting. I want to have more uh, art exhibits. I really like that part of uh, creativity, uh, putting things on a wall and having people watch them create installations. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I really want to just start producing a lot of work. I feel kind of behind, you Mm -hmm. know, when you look at some of these people, all the films and things they were able to do in the 70s. I don't know what was going on in the 70s, but it seems like it was a harder time. (laughs) But they were able to just, you know, get all this kind of media out. So that's that's what I would like to do. Yeah, I think... I I feel you. I feel behind as well. Sometimes I also think about the amount of time I spend on social media. (laughs) And it's like, Mm -hmm. if I took that away, I would have so much more room to produce. But then I'm also like, you know, I should let go um, for myself of feeling badly about not producing enough. But I know what you mean. There's like, you have this like swell of ideas. And it's like, how do I get them all out in the world? Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. It's a good behind. It's not like I I feel bad because I know it's coming. Yeah. But it's just about, like I said, making those boundaries to create that space where you can just go in and do it, you know? Well, that's all I have for you today. I mean, I I feel so... uh, I've learned a lot (laughs) and I feel enriched by this conversation. (laughs) And I just, I really, really, I know how busy you are and I'm so grateful to you for making time for this and particularly today. And so, yeah, I just thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for asking me to be a part of it. And, you know, I'm excited to have some things around jazz codes because I really made that for, you know, a, a more universal vibe. Yeah. So um, thank you for giving me this kind of platform to introduce my work to people who may not know me in certain ways. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much again and have a beautiful day. Yeah. <laughs> and I look thank forward you. to <laughs> seeing right. you in person at some point. <laughs> yes, it will come. It will happen. Yeah. All right. Peace. All right. Have a good day. Peace. You too. To find out more about Kamei's work, check out her website at moremother.net. You can also follow her on Instagram, Twitter, and Spotify at moremother. This season of Many Lumens is brought to you by Open Society Foundations. It is produced by Black Star Projects in partnership with Row Home Productions. The host and executive producer of Many Lumens is me, Mayori Carmel Holmes. This episode was produced by Dallas Taylor. Associate producers are Irit Reinheimer and Farah Rahaman. Guest associate producer is Eugene Liu. Managing producer is Alex Lewis. Executive editor is John Myers. Our music supervisor is David Little Dave Adams, Black Star's Music and Cinema Fellow, supported by the Pop Culture Collaborative. Our theme song was composed by Vijay Mohan and remixed by Little Dave. This episode features music by More Mother. Woody Shaw, elevator out of town, fall out ratios. If you've liked what you've heard so far this season, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and let us know what you think of the show. Sending you light and see you next time.